please join me in the call to worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Holiness is the beauty of God's temple, while time shall last. We worship God in the sanctity and freedom from our sins, which gives us through his life's blood. Opening him is Come Ye Thankful People Come, number 694 in the hymnal. continuously take up the project of liberation like Christ the King. Give us the courage to eagerly respond to the call to advocate for your justice and your peace in our communities. It is in the name of Jesus Christ our King we pray. Amen. Scripture reading today comes from John chapter 18 verses 33 through 37. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, 
My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And will the children come forward for children's sermon? <coughs>
today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son to be our Lord and our King. Help us today and every day to honor him, obey him, and follow his will for our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now I have a little children's bulletin that you can work on. It's, the, it's just a little activity sheet. And I know this is the most important thing, so. I do need it. All right. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, would you open our eyes that we might see, open our ears that we may hear, and open our hearts that we can experience the message that you have for us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, as I mentioned, today is a special day in the Christian year. It's Christ the King Sunday, or as some people prefer to call it, the Reign of Christ Sunday. It wraps up the year for us, the Christian year. It's kind of like our New Year's Eve a little bit. So it's a time that we can reflect on the year, reminisce on where we've been, what we've been doing, who we are, whose we are. And in our scripture reading today, Jesus is asked questions by Pontius Pilate that are related to those questions. Are you king of the Jews? Who are you? What have you done? Reflecting on what he's done, so very importantly, Jesus reminds us, of us, reminds us of the answer to our question as to whose we are when he tells Pilate in verse 37, everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. We are the ones who belong to the truth. If we belong to the truth, then maybe we should start with a discussion on what is truth. I got a little discouraged when I was reading about this. Do you know that one of the definitions of truth, according to Merriam-Webster, is, quote, a statement or idea that is true or accepted as true? Did you catch that? A statement that is accepted as true. Does that mean that then in reality that it is true or that it's perceived to be true? It's also defined as, truth is also defined as a, the body of real things, events, and facts. Unfortunately, in the world in which we live today, the word fact has become a substitute for the word truth, and it is being weaponized to redefine and understand the, our understanding of truth and morality. Fortunately, however, our passage today shows us what truth really is. We live in a day and age of something called moral relativism, where the notion of truth is, is relative to our own life circumstances, our own preferences, and our own biased opinions. There may be some of us sitting here today who, who agree with this, and I would challenge you to scripturally determine if that's accurate. People are going to say there is no absolute truth. We define our own truth. My truth is what I believe. Your truth is what you believe. Um, you know, just, and you can believe what you want to believe. Just don't tell me that your belief is the only correct view or the only truth. Isn't it interesting then that we've kind of transitioned from the idea of there is no truth or we have to tolerate everyone's truth to now relying heavily on being fact-checked 
in order to allow people to say or not to say something that they believe as, as truth. So having come up with that term fact check, we need another definition. Fact. Fact is defined as something that actually re exists, reality, and truth, or something said to be true or supposed to have happened. So fact checking is supposed to be something that analyzes claims and rates them as either true or false. But as we have just heard, our very definitions of truth and fact are something that seem to be a little bit wishy-washy. There's something that are as perceived as truth, something that is said to be true, whether or not they actually are or not. So isn't it no wonder that this world is in such chaos and disorder when we don't know what truth is anymore. We live in a world where there's a clash of truths, where groups of people are trying to force their idea of truth onto other groups of people. And all of these groups have their own versions of truth. And they say their version of truth is the real truth. If everybody's truth is real truth, then why are they clashing with each other? We have to face the fact that the, our battle in our nation right now is about truth. It's about spiritual truth. We're in a spiritual war right now and it hinges around truth. So I think the important question that we asked this morning is what is truth? Or, probably more importantly, what is the truth? So let's begin to look at our passage today. We're going to start by noticing that, that when Pilate begins questioning Jesus, Jesus turns the tables on him like he always does, right? And he asks Pilate in verse 34, are you speaking for yourself about this? So, in other words, he's asking, you know, are you wrestling with spiritual issues? Is that, what, is that why you're asking this? And maybe he is in verse 38 later on. Th there's that possibility. But in asking Jesus if he were king of the Jews, Pilate wanted to know two main things. First of all, he was checking to make sure that Jesus wasn't exalting himself over Caesar. Because nobody was to exalt themselves over Caesar. If you did that, the penalty was death. And Jesus answered by saying that his kingdom and his servants were not of this world. That's an important statement. And something that we as followers of Jesus have to realize that we, as subjects of Christ's kingdom, we are chosen and we are called out of this world. And we also have to notice that Christ didn't say that his kingdom was not in this world. He said his kingdom was not of this world. And therefore, his world isn't going to fail when this world does. The second thing that Pilate was checking to make sure was that Jesus wasn't a zealot. That he wasn't trying to lead some sort of insurrection. And this was the point. This, this was was one of the biggest concerns to, to Pilate. Proof that Jesus wasn't a zealot seeking to overthrow Rome could be seen in the fact that his service, servants didn't fight to protect him from being arrested where, and standing where he was standing at that moment. This didn't mean that, that Jesus' domain didn't include this world, because it does, but only that his kingship was not from this world. And since that was the case, Caesar or any civil government didn't have any worry about him being king of this world, leading an insurrection um, and challenging their government. So Jesus was not a zealot. He wasn't there in their version or their idea of what leading an insurrection would be. 
In verse 36, Jesus said, in, If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. If his kingdom had been a worldly one, Jesus would have had plenty of servants among the Jews who would have been there. They would have stood up. They would have fought with weapons to prevent Jesus from being arrested. And before we move on from here, I want to consider a moment for um, the, the idea of people leading insurrections, which is what the zealots did. They, they used force. They used violence to overtake people. They, um, they oppose established authority like governments, law enforcement, and established authority represented the rule of law. The law is usually founded on some sort of document of truth, notice the word there, like the U.S. Constitution, for example, okay? So an overthrow of truth occurs when the established authority, along with the documents of truth, come under attack and are questioned by people who are trying to discredit the masses. The zealots, it's very interesting watching the, the, um, the chosen I don't know, TV show, it's not on TV, but um, because they, they represent the zealots and, and their fighting and how they, they try to um, overtake the government. So it's very interesting to, to see that. It's fascinating that in the Greek, when Jesus spoke of my servants, the term he used was called aletheia. And aletheia, according to A.T. Robertson, is the, the, the term he used was the same one used for the temple police. So Jesus was saying my servants, the term he used was, was for like, law enforcement. And they, they were the ones, and so when he was saying you're attacking them, you're attacking the people who are opposing the temple police. When they oppose truth, they often, when people oppose truth, they often hate the police. They hate the authority. And Jesus' people were, Jesus' disciples were doing something a little bit different there. In 2 Corinthians 6, verse 7, the Apostle Paul said that as believers in Christ, we are commended to faithfully preach truth. God's power is working in us. We use the weapons of righteousness in the right hand for attack and in the left hand for defense. You see, the weapons of righteousness, our spiritual riot gear, so to speak, for fighting spiritual battles is com comprised of the word of truth, which is the word of God. The Bible is our source of truth. It's our founding document as believers. That is truth. But the word is also an offensive weapon. It's called the sword of the spirit in Ephesians 6 and in Hebrews verse 12. So we use the Bible to defend ourselves. We also use the Bible to attack. In addition to the Holy Word, our spiritual riot gear also includes the power of the Holy Spirit and the body armor of right standing with God. Being in right relationship, which we've talked about so much, we obtain and wear this by having a relationship with Jesus Christ. We can look all around us right now and we see fighting. We see verbal fighting. We see physical fighting. We see that in our real lives. And that's what Pilate was expecting from Jesus and his followers. The physical fighting, the verbal fighting, and all of that. But since Jesus' kingdom is not from this world, or not of this world, then the battle strategies that his followers used would not be from this world either. They weren't going to pick up sticks and knives and try to defend themselves. If we follow the way of truth in God, as it's called in Matthew 22, verse 16, then, as 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4 and 5 tell us, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We have to remember our fight is not physical. That's not what we're fighting. We're fighting a spiritual 
fight. And we must battle with something called the truth. So now getting back to today's scripture reading, Pilate was probably thinking to himself that, well, you know, every insurgent has a cause. That's why they're, they're fighting. And in verse 37, Jesus basically told him, you want to know my cause? Here it is. I have come to bear witness to the truth. That's it. I've come to bear witness to the truth. Something important to notice here, though. Jesus didn't use the standalone word truth. He didn't say, I came to bear witness to truth. He said, I came to bear witness to the truth. He didn't have an agenda. He didn't try to spin things to make it fit his version of truth. He didn't try to push some version of truth relative to his own views like we all do in the world today. He came to testify to the truth, capital T. And he bore witness as in having been sworn to testify under oath in a court of law. He was obligated to share the truth and nothing but the truth. Pilate didn't get that. If we would have read the next verse, Pilate turned away and muttered, what is truth? Pilate missed the important word in there. In verse 37 and 38, truth, the word truth comes up three times. The word used in this passage, like I said, is aletheia. And it means universally what is true in any matter under consideration. There is truth. Truth only becomes the truth when it is based on a universal standard. Otherwise, it's subject to interpretation and it leads us to where we are today. Everybody having their own version of truth. Jesus said in John 18, verse 37, For this cause I have come into the world, that I shall bear witness to the truth. So what is the truth? John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the truth. And he declared that the only way to be forgiven of sins and enter eternal life is through him. In our pluralistic society today, we have multiple truths and we hear about a lot of different ways to get to heaven. We can do good works. We can be a good person, whatever being a good person means. Again, it's that there undefined, wishy-washy, what might be good to you is not necessarily good to me. Um, worshiping other deities besides Jesus. Worshiping other deities in addition to Jesus. Nowhere in scripture does it say that that's the way to get to heaven. And let me tell you something else about Jesus. He is not just the truth. He's also the word of God. John 1, verse 1 through 4, and verse 14 tell us this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. So John said that Jesus is the word, full of grace and what? Grace and truth. So truth must be based on a universal standard if it is something to be absolutely true. And we do have a universal standard, a universal code of ethics, and it is the word. I have a whole bunch of scripture here. The word was there in the beginning. John verse 1. 
The earth came into existence by the word. Hebrews 11, verse 3. The word then came to us in the form of the perfect lamb of God. John 1, 14. And we have the word today in the form of the Holy Bible, which is also called the word of truth in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. Paul said in 2 Timothy 2, verse 5, that we must rightly divide the truth. That means we must teach and administer it correctly. And he said that the way we come to know Jesus and be saved is after having heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, Ephesians 1, verse 13. In John 15, 26 and 27, Jesus said that we are filled with the Holy Spirit, he, who he calls the Spirit of Truth. And he gives us the Holy Spirit so that we also might bear witness, which is what Jesus also did. Our jobs as Christians, when we hear people teaching and saying things that run contrary to the one true standard, the Bible, is to bear witness to the truth with them. When we hear alternative views to salvation, when we hear people worried about the fake news, when we hear fact checkers redefining reality and reshaping narratives, we have to boldly declare the truth. Our weapons are not sticks and stones like rioters. Our weapons are not swords or guns like the insurgents. Our weapons are the word of God and our voice. We have to know the Word of God to be able to use the Word of God as our weapon. I want you to listen to what Jesus prayed for the disciples in John 17, verse 14 to 19. I have given them your word, the truth, and the world has hated them because they are not of this world just as I am not of this world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. So Jesus prayed that we might be sanctified by the truth which comes from the word. He also prayed that we would remain in the world to do as he had done, to bear witness to the truth. And he prayed that we would be protected by the devil. Why did he do this? so that we could be truth bearers, so that we would live by the standards of another world and kingdom, and that this present world and those influences of, of Satan, we would be protected from them. I urge you, when you hear lies being spoken, to be bold and to share the truth in love that you have gleaned from the wellspring of life known as the Word of God. As I said, we must know scripture to be able to use it to defend and for offense, to spread his love, and to show his gospels. Pilate asked, as I said in the verse right after our scripture reading today, what is truth? The truth is that Jesus Christ has come into the world to make his father known to a people who were lost and separated by God. Christ came to restore our relationship with God that was broken way back in the Garden of Eden to undo what they had done. Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He hung on the cross. He died in our place. He rose from the dead, and he is coming again to restore us to God. That is the truth. And we must believe it, and we must put our faith in it, and we must trust it in order to be someone who is considered of the truth, belonging to God. 
This is the reason why Jesus said at the end of verse 37, everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. The key statement here is those who belong to the truth. Pilate didn't belong to the truth. That's why he turned away and said, what is truth? He didn't get it. He couldn't see that Jesus was the son of God, that Jesus was the way to eternal salvation. He was the king, not just of the Jews, but of all creation. You and I, who have been saved, who have been baptized into Christ, and who do live by faith, we do see it. We do know that he, Jesus is the King of Kings. We are able to say that, see that because we do belong to the truth. So let me tell you the truth about those who hear his voice. The truth is that because Jesus died on the cross from you and rose from the dead, you are holy. The truth is that because of Jesus, you are forgiven. The truth is that because of the work of the Son of God, you are righteous in God's sight. You are righteous in God's sight. You are perfect in his eyes and you are a dearly loved child of God. That is truth. And because of this one man, Jesus Christ, by his work and sending of his spirit that he called you into the gospel, he has sanctified you in truth. Jesus told us that there is one absolute truth when it comes to entering heaven, and I'll share it from John 14, verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is the truth. As we wrap up today and conclude our Christian year, we declare our intention to living a life that matters, the series that we've been studying. We will live a life of radical generosity that holds all our possessions and our, and our very lives very, very lightly. We look at life by taking the long view. We talked about that last week, though. While living fully in each moment, we don't let our moments define us because we know we belong to Christ. And we declare that we will live a life of belonging to truth. A truth that transcends our individual limited perspective and allows the community to hear the voice of Christ. The truth as a guide and hope for living a life that matters. Amen. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, so many times in our minds, we don't want to accept the fact that there is an ultimate, absolute truth. And that is you, your love for us, your dying on the cross to forgive us and make us children of God. Help us, Lord, to keep our minds open to seeing that just because we think something is true doesn't make it necessarily so, unless it is based on scripture. Help us, Lord, to understand your truth, to belong to the truth as you desire for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Our hymn of response is number 131, We Gather Together to Ask the Lord's Blessing.
continue to keep the offering plate at the back of the sanctuary, so we will now take time to thank God and praise him for our blessings by singing Glory Be to the Father. just a small portion of these back to you. We ask that you bless them. Bless the people who have given them, and we ask that they, we make wise decisions to use these offerings back to you to grow your kingdom here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come now to a time where we offer our prayer, prayers of praise and our prayer requests. Who has what for today? I can say one more thing about tonight after hanging of the greens, we're having soup supper. Soup supper after hanging of the greens. <laughs> Betty Bottles, you said? She's having surgery? I have um, my aunt Sharon Vanderweide is having back surgery this week, so prayers for her. Um, and then also I have the Rampy, Vaughn, and O'Regan families. They all had um, celebration of life services for loved ones who passed away either earlier this month or Allie's family, the O'Regan family, was several months ago. So prayers for them as they're remembering family members. Yes, sir. Anybody else? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, you are the Almighty. There's so much that you do for us, that you do with us, and that you do through us that we don't even recognize. Help us to have open eyes to see those things, and Lord, help us to praise you more fully for all that you do for us. We thank you that, that you do speak to us truth through your word, through the word Jesus, and through the word, the Holy Scriptures. Help us, Lord, to take time to learn them, to study them, to dig in and find out how you are speaking to us through the Bible today. We ask God that you be with the families that we listed. Be with Sharon, be with Betty, be with Janice as they're dealing with health issues. Be with the Paul Butler family, with the Rampies, the Vaughns, and the O'Regans as they are celebrating the lives that, of loved ones who were lost. There's so much pain, Lord. There's so much division. There's so much struggle and strife in this world today. And, and we as believers struggle with the same things that the world struggles with. Help us to be in the world, but not of the world. Help us to figure out what does that mean? And help us, Lord, to remember that you are truth. You are the truth. You are our universal standard. 
help us to remember that Christ died on the cross. He rose again from the dead and he ascended into heaven and that is the truth. Because of that, we are holy, truly forgiven children of you. Lord, we ask that you be with us this week. Send us out to do your will. And Lord, as we do that, we just pray the prayer that Jesus prayed, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our sending hymn is number 102, Now Thank We All Our God. Thank you.